Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. Just to let you know, we actually have, we have another baby uh, after the sermon, so you can look forward to that. Uh, we're so glad that each of you are here. My name's Jacob Armstrong. I'm one of the pastors here at Providence, and I just want to welcome each of you. I know that we have guests here that are with, with us for the first time, and good... 11 o'clock, you guys are looking good. This is really good. Thank you. Thank you for filling up the place here today. I want to welcome folks who are joining in live right now online or maybe watching later. Uh, we're, we're really honored that each of you have chosen to spend time with us and spend time with God in these moments. We are on our 15th week of studying the book of Luke. How excited are you? <laughs> okay. So yeah, that was good. Um, so... We are just walking through a long book of the Bible uh, called Luke. It's a gospel, which means it tells us the story or the good news of Jesus. It's found in the New Testament of the Bible. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you want to uh, find that. But we're going to be reading today from Luke chapter 5. It says, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he, Jesus, was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, Jesus asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets." And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Some of you guys know that a few weeks ago, uh, we had one of our, our just biggest celebrations, which is giving away our Christmas offering. So at our Christmas weekend, we have our biggest giving of the week uh, of the year, and we uh, give 100% of it away. So we were able to give a $168,000 gift to start a compassion center in Peru for children from age zero all the way up to 18, all kinds of amazing things, and also give another gift of the same size, $168,000 to an organization called Hananiah House, which is right here in the Nashville area. Hananiah House is a place for women who've been incarcerated for a time, once they get out of prison, to have a place to go, a place where they can be loved, taken care of, a place to live, many of them oftentimes up to a year. And there's actually an alumni house that after they graduate, if they still need a place to go, they can go. And they were looking to expand from one house to three. And so you all gave um, $168,000. So... Their executive director, Angela Wittenberg, sent me a letter this week, Mark and I a letter, and I wanted to just share with you a little bit of it. I wanted you to hear uh, the way that she describes um, the gift. She says, so this is to Providence Church. Thursday, we picked up our newest resident at the prison gates. For first meal out, she chose a Sonic burger and a strawberry shake, then met her new housemates before we went shopping for cozy pajamas and other basics. Next... She made her first week's meal plan and we bought groceries. Yesterday, she picked out clothes and organized her new room. Later, she excitedly toured the soon to be open second house and the alumni house. At the end of the busy, overwhelming first 24 hours, she said, no one has ever believed in me this much. No one has ever spent this much money and a whole day on me. Never, ever in my whole life. It makes me feel hopeful. And then Angela wrote, we all need to hear someone believes in me. I have learned that when Jesus speaks, like we've been reading the scripture here, when he speaks, there's usually a very uh, real physical element to it, that he's saying something about what's going on in the moment, like uh, something like, we're going to take you to get a sonic uh, shake and a burger. That's a real thing, right? That's a real physical thing. Amen? That's good, right? (laughs) But there's also, you can hear in the letter, something else going on. Did you feel it? There's a spiritual element to the physical thing that's going on. 
And so often when Jesus says something, when he, Jesus does something, you're like, oh, I see this thing that's happening really in my midst, but there's also something that's going to the heart, something that's affecting us on a deeper level. I believe that's what's happening in this scripture when Jesus says, launch out into the deep, talking to this guy, Simon, who will later get the name Peter. He really is telling Peter that there's some more fishing to be done and that there's some more fish to be caught, but there's something going on when Jesus says, launch out into the deep. There's something going on in Peter's heart, something that he feels, something that he has to take notice of. The scene for this scripture is by the lake of Gennesaret, and we've been studying the book of Luke and we've been going from Jerusalem to Galilee. Well, just so you know, the lake of Gennesaret is just another name for the Sea of Galilee. It had a lot of different names, kind of depending on where you were standing around the lake, the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee, or in this case, the Lake of Gennesaret. It would be, uh, the Sea of Galilee actually is not so big. It's more like a lake. You can see to the other side on an, almost any side that you're on. So it'd be something like maybe if we were at Percy Priest Lake and you were in Laverne, you might say, this is the Lake of Laverne. I don't know, probably no one would ever say that. Or this is the Lake of Smyrna, or this is the Lake of Mount Juliet. It depended on your vantage point, what you might call the lake. And if you think about a lake that size, you probably know if there's a big commotion going on with something in one of the towns that are around the lake. And that's what was happening around Galilee or around the Lake of Gennesaret. This guy, Jesus, had stirred up all kinds of noise because of what he was doing. Almost everyone all around the lake would have heard that Jesus had driven out an unclean spirit in the synagogue up north in Capernaum. And they would have heard that just a little bit below that in a house, there had been a woman who'd had a fever who'd been healed. And now all these people were trying to get to Jesus for him to heal their sick people, for him to drive out their demons. It was a frenzied, chaotic moment when Jesus arrives on the banks of the Lake of Gennesaret where Simon is mending or washing his nets. Simon was a Galilean fisherman and he was doing the work that any fisherman would do at the end of the shift. He was getting his nets ready for the next shift that would start that night. We're also told that he'd had a bad night of fishing no fish. So he was discouraged. He was tired. When Jesus starts coming into his uh, beach there and all these people are pushing against him, they're pushing Jesus back to the point where he's getting his feet into the water. And so Jesus takes a step, steps into Simon's boat and he says, hey bro, will you push this out a little bit so I can teach? And so Jesus is in the boat. Peter sends him out and Peter is standing there holding a rope while Jesus starts to give a sermon. It's like he wasn't planning on going to church that day, right? He wasn't ready for that moment. And here he was, captive. He couldn't leave the sermon. It's sort of like you are right now. You're stuck. For you to get up and go, I'm gonna see you. I'm gonna notice, right? There's no way Peter could let go of the rope. He just had to stay there for, if he was lucky, maybe a 25-minute Jacob sermon, right? Or if he was of a different uh, church, maybe a longer sermon. Y'all can go check it out sometime, right? No, I don't want you to go check it out. But there are guys that preach a lot longer than me, so just be happy uh, with what you got. <laughs> At the end of however long the sermon was, however, if it was 30 minutes or three hours, at the very end of that, Jesus turns to Simon and when he'd finished speaking says, put out into the deep, or you've heard me say, launch out into the deep. That's the King James version. I like the way it sounds. Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. For sure, up until this moment, Peter has considered himself a normal guy, a Galilean fisherman, a guy who is feeling a very physical moment. He's tired, his back might hurt, his hands might hurt from casting all night. And now here he is uh, hanging out with a, a rabbi who's trying to speak into his life. I think that Peter was probably like a lot of fishermen you might know. I like to go fishing and most of the fishermen I know are really normal dudes. They're guys who uh, you know, aren't too sophisticated perhaps, but they don't mind being out on a lake in the wind and the rain and in the dark. They don't mind getting up early. My fishing buddies have all been guys who are kind of strong guys, maybe a tattoo here or there, say a curse word, drink a beer. They're crusty kind of guys. I guess you don't know anyone like that. Um, <laughs> they're way more comfortable being on a river or a lake than in a church. That's Peter, the son of a fisherman the grandson of a fisherman, the great-grandson of a fisherman of Galilee. 
And we know from our study of Peter that he was, we don't use this word that often, but I like it. uh, He was a rascal, no doubt. And what I mean by rascal in its purest form, don't get offended, okay? What I mean by rascal in its purest form is somebody like us. Who has a few rough edges, a spark in their eye, probably doesn't see themselves as a saint, but still kind of person you wanna hang around. God gave me the greatest blessing, hear my heart, God gave me the greatest blessing to have a church full of rascals. I love you guys. Wonderful, peculiar, gifted, but you all have a past. You all have a story. I haven't met a one of you that doesn't have a few mistakes under your belt. And we're all here holding the rope, listening to the rabbi on the beach. And we're thinking, he's talking to me and he is talking to me. You see, the rascal, like Simon Peter, is precisely the one who God wants to use. Jesus says, launch out into the deep and let down your nets. And Peter's like, I just finished a 10-hour shift. My nets are finished. I have to go home. I've got no lunch. I've got no money to pay the bills. And now you're saying to me, what? Launch out into the deep? You're saying to me, let's go fishing It has a very practical meaning for Peter, but you can tell it's doing something in his heart. I would not be surprised if right now there's maybe one or two people in the room for whom these words are doing something in your heart already. Launch out into the deep. Why? Because they're Jesus' words and they have the ability to do that. Peter's response to Jesus of go fishing some more is perfect. It's the perfect response, okay? He says, master, we fished all night and took nothing. Have you ever tried to explain your situation to God? When he's maybe asking you to do something, you say, oh, let me, let me help you understand what's happening. You're like, Jesus, I don't think you see the context clues here. You're saying go fishing. I'm a fisherman. I've fished all night. In fact, Galilean fishing only takes place at night. The water is super clear and so the fishermen go out under the cover of darkness so the fish don't see the movement of the boats and the movement of the fishermen. He's like, you're from Nazareth, you're a preacher guy and you're telling me the son and the grandson of a fisherman how to fish on my lake? He says, master, we toiled all night and took nothing but at your word or as another version says, because you say so or as even yet another version says, nevertheless, I will let down the nets. He lets Jesus know we already tried fishing. But he says, because you say so, I'll do it. And by saying, because you say so, Peter is saying, whatever happens now is all your fault. (laughs) So whatever happened, I'm not gonna be a fool fishing in the middle of the day on my own, but because you say so, I'll do it. I I just love this part because I see it in rascals so often. You don't have to have great faith. You don't have to have huge faith. You can have a reluctant faith. But if you say, nevertheless, I'll do what you say, God. If you say, because you say so, memorize that line. Because you say so, will get you really far with the Lord. Sometimes it's all you got to say. It's like, you don't understand my situation, God. But because you say so, I'll do it. And when, when he says that, they go out and throw the nets and they start catching so much fish. <laughs> There's just fish everywhere. It's a fisherman's dream. It's a miraculous catch of fish. Their nets are shaking and then breaking under the weight of fish. They call their other buddy's boat over. They start pulling fish into the boats and the boats are sinking. The fishermen are laughing. They're hollering. They're trying to get to the shore, pulling boats, pulling nets, shiny fish, jumping all over the place. Peter comes up onto the shore. He falls down at the feet of Jesus. And this is what he says to Jesus. He says, you have got to get away from me. Crazy, huh? It says, when Peter saw it, it is the fish. (laughs) He fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Launch out into the deep was not just fishing advice for Peter. He realized in that moment, this guy was coming after my whole heart. He wants me. He has just involved me in a miracle. And Peter knew that he was a rascal in every way. And so he gave, you may have done this before with God, he gives Jesus an out. He says, you actually don't have to take me, man. 
He actually pleads with him and says, please don't take me. Peter realizes there's no way. I don't have any chance of getting my act cleaned up in time to join you in what you're wanting to do with me. And Jesus says, chill out. He says, don't be afraid, man. Set your fear down. From now on, you'll be catching people. Jesus says, you're right, Peter. I'm not just talking about catching fish when I said launch out into the deep. I'm speaking to you. And I want you to join me, like it or not, just the way you are. I don't care where you are right now, but God wants you to go deeper. He has something more for you. It's important to understand that followers of Jesus, people who want to be disciples, there's a simple principle at work here uh, that I want to show you. I think it's super, super important. And the reason I think it's so super important is because we often get it mixed up. Being a disciple is a belong, then become proposition. You get to belong fully to Jesus in your rascal state. And then you get to become something different, which is really cool. But this is really important because there's oftentimes things in our lives where we get this mixed up. Being a disciple is not become this and then you get to belong. Hear me. Uh, you know, this happens a lot of times when you're a teenager. If you can become this certain way, you can be a part of this group, right? Or maybe in your career, if you've gotten these certifications and this education, if you become this, you get to belong. That makes sense. But some of you have experienced this in your family, right? To be fully belonging, you have to act a certain way or look a certain way. And then some of you have experienced it in the church. If you become just like us, then you can belong. And so many people never get to belonging to the family of God because they can't see themselves looking like the people who go to church. Well, I'm here to tell you by the evidence of Simon who gets the name Peter and eventually gets the keys to the kingdom of God from Jesus, <laughs> that Jesus invites you first to belong and then become. And this, my friends, is a belong then become church. Everyone is invited to follow Jesus, everybody. I don't care what your list says about you being disqualified. However, you will probably get pretty annoyed if no part of you ever wants to go deeper with Jesus because we talk about that all the time. You won't like Providence Church for long if you think you're just good where you are. Jesus will start stripping things away from you. And in fact, the standard for what you'll have to give up is everything. Listen to this. And when they brought their boats to land, they left everything. These are the first disciples. We've been talking about here, we wanna be disciples. Well, they left everything and followed him. When I was 18 years old was uh, kind of the first time I felt God um, asking me to be a pastor. It was a, um, a very surprising thing in my life because I didn't see myself doing that. I was, I was really sort of shocked by it. And in fact, I didn't feel sanctified. I wasn't even really doing everything the right way. But I had this moment where I was praying three weeks after my 18th birthday I was actually on my knees praying, talking to God, you know, trying to figure some things out. I was only praying in my mind, but then I had these words come out of my mouth. The words were, God, I'm going to serve you as a pastor. I had never thought those words. I had never wanted to do those words. And if I could have grabbed them and shoved them back into my mouth, I would have done it. I made a decision with those words to not tell anyone. That's what I decided I would do with this strange word that came out of my mouth that I was gonna be a pastor. Well, I made it a couple of months and I was sitting outside one night with my then girlfriend, Rachel, who's my wife now. We would sit out on the front porch right up until curfew. I'm sure my father-in-law loved, loved that. He's here right now. And <laughs> we would um, sit there and I told her that this night, well, first of all, this is, this is a picture of what we looked like when we were 18, just so you can get an idea. Uh, we had the same hair. And uh, she still has that hair, but something happened with me along the way. Okay, take it down. And, uh, but I, I wanted you to, to kind of see what we were dealing with. And so I said to her, I was like, I got something crazy I got to tell you. And she's like, what is it? I said, I, I feel like God told me, like through my own mouth, I know this sounds so crazy, that I'm supposed to be a pastor. And she said, I knew it. And she's like, I knew something happened that weekend. I, you've been different since then. And, I, and, and we're like, what are we gonna do? And this, was, this is what we decided to do. I said, let's not tell anyone. <laughs> and maybe if we don't tell anyone, it'll go away. Well, here's what I learned. Launch out into the deep 
When God speaks a word to you, it doesn't go away just because you don't tell anyone. And that word started just kind of like burn in me. And a few months later, I was a college freshman and all I could think about was the night God spoke those words through my mouth. And so what I decided to do was call my mom. I was in my dorm room, I was crying because I was just didn't know what to do with this word. And so I didn't want my roommate to see me crying. And so I pulled the phone into the hallway, which was connected to the wall by a cord. <laughs> this is how hard it was back then, guys. So I'm just barely in the hall. And I called my mom because I needed her to tell me that I could not do this. I thought if anybody knew that I was a rascal, it was her. She'd watch me all the way through that I'm a rascal, I'm from a family of rascals, I'm a fisherman kind of guy. And I just knew that if I told my mom what was going on, that she would get me out of this mess. And so I said, mom, this thing happened where I feel like God is wanting me to be a pastor. And what my mom said to me that day changed my life forever. I'll never forget it, mom. She said, oh, Jacob, I've known that since you were a little boy. And she began to recount for me all of these moments in my life that she had seen the impression of God on my heart. Instead of like me keeping a list of all the reasons that I was a rascal and should be disqualified, she'd been keeping a different kind of list that she shared with me right in that moment. I saw myself as a complete rascal and God said, I want you. And so what I did that night was I told God, because you say so, I'll do it. And now I blame everything that comes after that. <laughs> Launch out into the deep. My friends, launch out into the deep. He's saying something to you on a surface level. Some of you already have an indication of kind of where God's leading you in your life. But there's a deeper call on the heart of a disciple. And the way Jesus calls us with this wide, wide grace leaves no excuses for the rascal. The rascal just has to step in and fall at the feet of Jesus. Peter says, I'm a fisherman full of sin. And Jesus says, I want you to catch men. Peter says, Jesus, get away from me. You don't know who I am. But Jesus says, I actually do know who you are. I've been the pastor of this church for 16 years, a church full of rascals. We set it up that way. God gave us a call to see people who feel far away from God come close to him. And every week I have somebody tell me, Jacob, you don't know who I am. They, they already have the list of all the reasons that they're disqualified from being used in the miracles of God. People have all been saying to me for 16 years, you don't know who I am. Well, I got this new thing. I haven't done it yet, but I'm gonna try it out. You might be my first one. The next person that says to me, you don't know who I am, I'm gonna say back to them, you don't know who you are. You're a child of God. You are given value in your birth and in your life. And you have been grafted into the family of God through Jesus from Nazareth who showed up on the beach to people just like you. I've seen it a million times, guys. And I want a church full of rascals, not a bunch of puffed up perfect people. I want a church of people like Peter, honestly, whose first reaction when God calls them is to say, I'm not so sure you have the right guy. That's the heart that gets you in the work. If you think I'm the right guy or the right girl or I got it all figured out, it doesn't go the right way for you. I've been seeing a revival in this church, our church, our little church here in Mount Juliet. And the only thing that can inhibit us is if we dig our heels in and think we've got it all figured out, that we're just good where we are. It's comfortable to stay where you are, but we have to be open to change continually, open to going deeper always. If God says go, we have to go. If God, if, if God says wait, we have to wait. We have to obey the word of God. Launch out into the deep. I don't know what that means for you, but I bet you might have an idea. And we have to be ready to be totally changed, to give up essentially everything. God is gonna call some of you to some really big things. He's gonna call some of you to suffering, some of you to great sacrifice. Some of you are gonna start churches. Some of you are gonna start Bible studies. Some of you are gonna start places like Hananiah House. Let me close by reading you the last part of Angela's letter. This was from her to us, to you guys. She said, Providence Church, your trust in us shows us the founders 
board, staff, and volunteers that we are keeping to the pace that the Holy Spirit is setting for Hananiah House. It helped confirm for us that we were following God, not our own crazy idea, and expanding to a second and third house. Over and over, Providence Church, you've joined us in voicing the belief that these women matter. All you have done in service for them repeats your faith that we are all able to live the life God intended no matter what mistakes we have made. Together, we get to watch him prove it is never, ever too late to turn back to his love. She says, thanks to your amazing gift, we get to show and tell our newest resident and our future housemates, precious, God says you are worth investing in and so does his church. And that's my word for you today. Precious rascals of God. God says you are worth investing in and so does this church. Let us pray.